Hello, good afternoon and welcome to News Today on your Join News channel here on Multi TV. Coming up, Pressure Group Occupy Ghana demands multi-party investigation by Parliament into a possible conflict of interest case following the President's decision to accept a car gift from a Bokinabe contractor. Meanwhile, opposition MPP is also calling for a bipartisan body to also conduct investigations into the said issue. We bring you excerpts of that media briefing that ended a short while ago and also ahead. Control and Accountant General's Department to investigate in Dominic Hospital for paying more than 15 workers salaries they did not work for for the past uh, eight months or so. We have details of those stories, plus a lot more, including business, sports, entertainment, as well as international updates, all coming up in the next hour here on News Today. Stay with us. My name is Kwabna Chen Chehini Bwati. Many thanks for joining us here on News Today. To our very first story, the Zaha and Pressure Group Occupy Ghana is demanding a multi-party investigation by Parliament into issues of a possible conflict of interest case arising from the President's decision to accept a car gift from a Bokinabe contractor. A report by Joint Issues Manasseh Azuri Awoni showed the President took a Ford Expedition gift from a Bokinabe contractor in 2012. Now, following the report, Shraj has commenced an investigation into the issue after receiving complaints from two groups. But pressure group Occupy Ghana is demanding a multi-party investigation by the country's legislative arm, insisting that Shraj is not fit to conduct the investigations. Let's get more now for my colleague Felix Akuyam, who has been reading through that statement by the pressure group Occupy Ghana. And Felix joins me now in the studio with excerpts of that extracts of that. So, Felix, can you tell us much more about uh, what Occupy Ghana is saying? Well, um, Kobna, the pressure group Occupy Ghana is just calling for an investigation into this scandal. Mm -hmm. um, they are saying that they want the police administration to investigate it because they think that um, as the fact, as we have the facts now. I mean, it triggers something that should, you know, cause a police and, I mean, a parliamentary probe into this issue. And for them, the president has breached certain provisions in our laws, in our criminal laws, and that should trigger an investigation. Quite apart from that, they are saying that they will be glad if Shraj can investigate this issue, but they also recognize the fact that Shraj currently as a stand does not have a substantive head, and so... Um, Shraj is not really in a position to really investigate this issue. They also go ahead to talk about conflict of interest. I mean, they mentioned the fact that the Constitution's um, position on conflict of interest, I mean, regarding public officers, is clear. It is unambiguous. I mean, they are saying that it is clear that no public official should put himself in a position that could possibly, you know, ignite conflict of interest. And in this case, they are saying that the president clearly has, you know, breached this provision. But they are also alleging that we don't have the full facts, but even the facts as we have it now is very worrying. So they are just imagining, you know, what we don't know. And that's why they are stressing on the need for, you know, a body to investigate this issue. Okay. They are also, I mean, also reiterating the fact that's been reiterated by a lot of you know groups calling for probe into this issue the fact that the president himself you know you know designed a code of conduct for his ministers and this also talks about the conflict of interest that we you know are talking about True. and so in conclusion all they are saying is that they want an independent probe into this issue they feel that you know the issue is worth you know investigating and I mean, the matters must be investigated thoroughly okay. so that if the president, you know, is guilty, then the processes that will lead for his impeachment or whatever has to follow will, will follow, follow suit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I know you mentioned this a, a while back, but I just want to again uh, find out why they are uh, 
I, we all know what the constitution says. Obviously, yeah. Shah has the mandate to do all these things yeah. uh, following uh, reports that they receive. Now they've received the reports, they have commenced the investigations. Now they are saying that they do not think Shah is fit to conduct this very investigation. And what are the reasons they are giving here? One reason they are mentioning is the fact that Shah just stands now doesn't have a substantive head. Okay. And um, often, to I know the one point that's often reiterated by many people, many see Shah as, you know, often a toothless bulldog. They always are not proactive. Mm -hmm. You know, they have to wait for people to, you know, bring petitions to them before they act. And they feel that this is an issue that Shraj, you know, should not necessarily wait for someone to come and say, I'm petitioning you. And they are equally worried mm -hmm. that, I mean, if even Shraj goes ahead to investigate it, they, they are worried about their independence, you know, and how, you know, how independently Shraj can investigate this issue and bring the president to book if he has to be brought to right book. felix many thanks for that update and that was my colleague felix akoyamu joined us in studio with extracts of that statement by pressure group occupy ghana while they are demanding a multi-party probe into this very issue they do want the legislative arm of government to lead that very charge and then uh, they want the right processes to be followed well they think charge is not the best the best uh, institution to handle this very issue at this particular point in time. Well, one of their arguments they're raising is that Shraj, for, for instance, does not even have a substantive head, and this they think is going to, in a way, affect that investigation. But the New Patriotic Party, that's the largest portion party in the country, has also been addressing a press conference today on this very same issue. Now, they are demanding a bipartisan committee to investigate a possible conflict of interest case arising from the president's decision to accept that car gift. Uh, Fred Smith was there and he's joining me now on phone with some more. So Fred, can you tell us more about uh, what the MPP has been saying at this media briefing? Well, we do not have Fred on the line. We'll try and raise him uh, back once we're able to do that. We'll bring you more on that story. But away from that now, and workers at the Ghana Highways Authority have this morning been uh, demanding a probe. They've actually been protesting the dismissal of their chief executive. Now, the staff suspects Mr. Michael Abiete has been sacked without any formal communication to the workers. Joseph Akable was there and spoke to some of the workers. Within uh, the premises, um, why do you, do you have that around? Uh, well, uh, it's a decision of the workers to mount those red bounds to uh, present our uh, uh, sentiments of something happening. Unfortunately, last Monday we realized that our chief executive came to park his vehicles here. He has not been coming to office. He is not on leave, and we don't know why. So we are now conducting investigations to know what is happening. And that's why we put the red band there. But if you've gone ahead to put out the red band, then that gives the indication that indeed workers have already picked signals of something that has gone wrong. And um, what have you picked? Up so far? Oh. We are still conducting our investigation, so we are not setting now. As of now, I think we, we were informed that we were going out. So we are still on our way going to the TUC. We are trying to find out exactly what is happening before we come out. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm saying at once, because the normal process is an appointing authority puts your boss in charge, so if there is any reason and he's not around, unless perhaps there is more that the workers know, because it doesn't, I don't think that is the case generally, that when you go to any organization and you don't, the boss doesn't come to work or he has left, he has packed the sky and he has packed the things and he has left. I don't think that alone could just pack the workers to put red bands around, unless perhaps the workers know something that the public doesn't know. Uh, well, the issue is that that has, that has not been the norm, and he has not conducted himself in that manner before. So we, we, are, we are a little bit skeptic, so that's why we're going around to find out exactly what happened. We are going to consult him himself. We would like to visit him. We would like to visit our board members and then go to the TUC and, if possible, the ministry to find out exactly. Yesterday we had a meeting among ourselves and we've strategized to do that, so we are yet to take off on those investigations. So the workers are not happy um, about uh, the fact that... The is not around. That's all. And we understand it has the potential to affect in terms of the salary of workers for the month. Uh, well, uh, you know, we've been doing validation before salaries are paid. And he, I think he is the final validator. So once that he is not around, and that's one of the concerns of workers. So if we put Red Band there, we want our chief executive to come and then validate our salaries for us. 
uh, we are we are picking signals that um, government may have asked them to step aside. Uh, are you aware of that? As at now, I'm not aware of that. But before his departure, he didn't um, inform you of why he's leaving. You know, if from the onset I told you that it has not been the norm, so if he have informed us, we would not have been threatened. So that's why the situation, as you say it now. So the meeting you'll be having today, we understand um, some few minutes time you'll be having a meeting. Um, what are you seeking to discuss at that meeting? We are going to, we, we want to visit our mother union to seek directives as to how to handle a situation like this. So we are going there, from there we'll meet our board and then we'll, if possible we try to find out where we can locate our chief executive and then contact him personally. We understand he has packed his uh, personal belongings and he has also brought back the car. I am aware of the vehicle, but I'm not aware of the personal belongings. Because I'm not here, I'm stationed in Hu. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you too. Uh, dear leader, um, what are the workers saying? Oh, we are praying that our chief executive should come back to the office. Because they, they are not happy. And up to now, we don't know the reason why. He is in the house. So we are working on the clock to let him come back to office. Is, is that a view of all the workers? Or? Yes, please. Everybody. Everybody from here to two. Because he's a very good man. We don't know any bad thing he has been doing. He's very free to everybody. So as he's not in the office since Monday, in fact, we are not happy. So we just put the red man showing signal that there's something going on here. So that if we go to the TUC and then we meet our boss, he's the general secretary, there that we can come out with something. But now, we can't see anything. Are the workers, which extent are they willing to go with this? Because aside the red man, are they willing to even go beyond that and demonstrate if need? Uh, if we hear what has happened and he is in the house, and we do all efforts that he should come back and this and no, we will advise ourselves as the union. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. We have so many things we used to do. After a red man sitting without doing anything and demonstration. That's so all you all they want is they want they their... want him to come back to the office. We want him back so that everybody will be happy. Thank you very much. Well, let's return to that previous story where I brought you that situation at the NPP headquarters where we do know that the party is also calling for a probe into this issue of uh, the president, uh, who, where, where we are told that quite a number of people uh, have raised issues with his gifts, a gift he chose to accept, a gift that many suppose could lead to a possible conflict of interest case. Let's get onto the phone lines and I speak to Fred Smith, who was at the MPP headquarters earlier today. He's been following up on this issue. There was a media briefing, and he's joining us on phone now with more on that. So, Fred, can you tell us more about what the New Patriotic Party has been, has been saying about this very issue at this media briefing? Fred, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Right. So can you tell us more about the stand of the NPP as far as this issue is concerned? What have they been saying? Well, the party has been speaking, and he says that they want the president to personally come out and respond uh, publicly to these allegations of conflict of interest against him. Uh, they don't believe that the statement from Edward Omane Boama, who is our communications minister, uh, is enough. They say it doesn't support the facts on the ground. For instance, they are saying that in this statement, uh, it mentions that they were given the pass from uh, our, our Upper East region through such so they can move the vehicle. And according to that statement, that's supposed to uh, show that the, the president was being transparent about this. They say no, uh, there was no point in doing that because if it was coming to the president, and in an open manner, that, sh that wouldn't have happened. They are questioning why the registration documents 
cannot be found at the DVLA. They are saying that it has something to do uh, with the thing, uh, the excuse that it was added also to the presidential fleet. It's an afterthought. They don't believe that that was the original intention. And it's a reason why uh, they believe the documents at the DVLA uh, have gone missing. So they believe that the president has involved himself with uh, these allegations of conflict of interest and must be investigated. And they want parliament to lead that investigation. They want a bipartisan uh, inquiry into this whole matter that should be conducted publicly. Uh, so that every Ghanaian can follow and the conclusion arrived at. You're saying that whatever conclusions they make uh, should determine the kind of punishment that should be given to the president. Right. President, many thanks for that update. And that was uh, John Isis Fred Smith who brought us more from that media briefing by the opposition New Patriotic Party, which ended a short while ago. You're watching News Today here on your Joy News channel on Multi TV. We're taking a break. We'll be back shortly with some more stories. Stay tuned. Many thanks for staying with us here on News Today to some more stories now. And access to healthcare is a basic need. However, in sub Saharan Africa, particularly in Ghana, not many are able to access it. Now, the Confanochi Teaching Hospital has, over time, been a place that many in the Ashanti region have turned to in times of health need. But recently, the hospital has been unable to attend to such needs of hundreds of patrons who throng it daily. Lava FM's Kosidebra tells us why in the following report. Eight new elevators procured by management are currently being installed to replace obsolete ones at the hospital's G block. It is the first time in 20 years. Azimu office, you made a special presentation to the president on the issue, and the president pledged to um, arrange for some list for the hospital. And true to his words, the hospital has now taken the delivery of eight new lifts which are being installed. The story at the magnetic resonance imaging, as well as the accident and emergency centers, is unpleasantly different to Toshiba and Siemens branded computerized topography or CT scanners, each at the centers are either broken down or erratic. Patients are not the only ones at the receiving end of this unfortunate situation at Ghana's number two health facility. Medical professionals are even more frustrated having to work under such conditions. So you see that the CT scan is broken now, or we've run out of films, films for printing the images. So when any of these things happen, then it affects the delivery of work here. So when you come here, they ask you, I mean if the films are run out, they ask you, is the doctor ready to take out just our reports without the films? If the doctor says no, it means we can't do it for you. By the CT scan breaks are now and there's nothing can do if you have phones. So sometimes these are, it keeps recurring. I mean, it's, it's a frequent thing that happens. So that's why I'm sure people complain about it. And people in the hospital complain. But it keeps recurring. Today it breaks down, you sort it out. The next day you run out of phones. Like, it keeps recurring, it's still recurring. So sometimes for you working in the party, you get frustrated. You don't know where to, what to do. He says the situation has been compounded by the failure to train resident radiographers to take care of the equipment. When they were brought in, uh, when the machines, I mean, before installation, uh, we had a meeting. We had a meeting with the, those who were supposed to uh, install the machine. And we were told to bring names of two radiologists, two doctors, two radiographers, the, techn the, the technicians, uh, the technical people, those who were supposed to operate the machine. Two radiologists, and I think anesthetists. Uh, there was supposed to be anesthetists. But they were sent out for training. And we were told that it was part of the contract. It never happened. Uh, it never happened as you see now. It's been how many years now? Uh, um, about four. About four years. It never happened. And we go back to ask them, um, what about that? Uh, and another person will tell you it wasn't part. See, a different person now tells you it wasn't part of the contract. But the other is that we don't have a copy of the contract. So we wouldn't know, you understand? Because our radiographers, that's a complaint they make, are challenged in some aspects of the imaging. Because eh? they didn't have adequate training. Yeah. 
Hospital spokesperson Mr. Frempong says efforts to get expatriate engineers to repair the Siemens CT scanner have proved futile. African agents to come and repair. Unfortunately, three attempts by this agent has not been successful. We have reported the matter to the appropriate authorities and the company has pledged to send down another batch of engineers to come and take a look at it. So the inability of the hospital to repair that CT scan it's not because of lack of resources. It is an engineering issue that Siemens is working around the clock to resolve. The official vehicle of the chief executive of the hospital was the Nizam Patrol. And it is over 13 years old and therefore it was prone to breakdowns and frequent maintenance. So a decision was taken to replace it. Authorities say they have brought the situation to the attention of the Ministry of Health for intervention. Until perhaps a miracle is performed, patients would have to count on luck to access can services on the erratic equipment. Others would have to look elsewhere, most likely at higher cost. From the Okonfanochi Teaching Hospital, reporting for Joy News, Kwesi Debra. But there's more on this story in subsequent bulletins, particularly on our news and news analysis program, The Pulse, which is at 3 p.m. on the same channel. Now, away from that, and loved and forgotten, I'm sure many of you remember that compelling documentary by the GJA's journalist of the year, Seth Kwambwati. Now, I'm speaking of that documentary that showcased the plight of several remand prisoners in the country and subsequently compelled authorities to begin the Justice for All program that led to the decongestion of the country's prisons. Now, I'm sorry to disappoint you if you think what you saw could not get any worse, because it actually is. In his latest piece, Seth Kwambwati returns to the country's prisons to follow up on the states of the several who have been abandoned to rot. Here are excerpts of that documentary. According to the United Nations standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners, all countries have an obligation to observe certain basic human rights standards in their prisons. Standards regarding the conditions of detention must be observed regardless of a state party's level of development. The UN demands a minimum floor space and cubic content of air for each prisoner, adequate sanitary facilities, clothing, which shall by in no manner degrading or humiliating, provision of a separate bed, and provision of food of nutritional value adequate for health and strength. I decide to go around and check how far these standards are being met in this prison. The prison administration is supposed to provide inmates with food of wholesome quality. More than one city, 80 pesos is needed to provide this kind of meal for inmates. For years, prisoners have been fed on one city, 80 pesos daily. Director General of the Ghana Prison Service, Emmanuel Ajato, says this amount is woefully inadequate. Until all these things are done, inmates will continue drinking watery porridge without sugar and either eat their famous gari, which goes with a kind of colored water mixed with palm oil, supposed to be palm nut soup, or bangkung, which goes with what I would describe as improvised granite soup. For first-hand information, the inmates, together with their officers, agreed to lead me to their places of convenience. The stench is extremely unbearable. Okay, so I have been here for just a few hours. The congestion is just too much. And as you can hear in the background, they are not very happy. So anytime they see uh, people like us around, they will go to tell their stories. I am struggling to breathe as a result of the stench and heat here, all because I am a first-time visitor. Um, I wonder what asthma patients here go through. The remand population as of today is 625, and there are only four toilets here. Unfortunately, two of them are out of use now. This means the 625 inmates here share only two toilets. They form long queues in the morning to wait for their turn. At times, they do it on themselves. And just a few steps away from the almost half full water closet are scores of inmates preparing different kind of food from their make-believe palm nut soup. Before they can eat the gari provided them, 
they have to sieve and do away with some large particles in the gallery. Remember, all these things are taking place not far from their toilet. I wonder what will happen when there is outbreak of cholera. Uh, as you can see, uh, this gentleman is fortunate to have, re uh, to have received food from home. Uh, so family, family members were here to visit him and they brought him food. So he's sharing with his friends here. So it tells the difference between the food they eat here and the one we eat outside. I am back at the Kumasi prison. It is a few minutes past 4 p.m. and it is time for the inmates to be locked up so officers are conducting their last roll call. Inside the cells, the picture looks horrifying. Human beings packed up in a room with not even an inch space between them. They have been carefully arranged according to the years they have spent in the prison. The leader of this cell, Isifu Musa, says there are names for each sleeping position. Those in the middle are referred to as sardines because we have arranged them like the way sardines are arranged in a tin. There's no space between them. On my extreme right are the elderly and those who are not well. We call them Tabo Tabo. The aged sleep there. Those on my left, very close to the door, we call them pickups. They squat throughout the night. They are like passengers in a stationary vehicle. They can only get up when the gate is opened in the morning. For those on my left, very close to the wall, they have been here for over four years. Those under the bed are those who have not really stayed here for long. They have not gone beyond two years. Inmates on the bed are those who sweep here and ensure the place is clean always. Some are also peacemakers. Those on the top are the leaders. <laughs> the left to rot premiering Wednesday, 22nd June at 4 p.m. at the auditorium of the New Court Complex and airing on Joy FM Thursday, 23rd June at 8.30 a.m. on the Super Morning Show and 27th and 28th June, 6.30 p.m. on your Joy News channel on Mouth TV. Remember the premiere of Seth Kwambwating's latest documentary, Left to Rot, uh, as today. Uh, in fact, it's premiering today at 3 p.m. at the New Court Complex. Uh, if you can, please pass by and just see the deteriorating states of the country's prisons. Time now for some business updates here on News Today. Stay with us. Now time to do some business and Ghana made it among the top economies in Africa with the highest investment by foreigners. That's according to the report by the United Nations. Yeah. And 
The report tracks foreign direct investments of the over 100 members of the United Nations and makes some key recommendations on how they can improve investments and what can be done to ensure that their economies benefit from the capital inflow. According to the UNCTAD investment report, Angola topped with an FDI of $8.7 billion for 2015, representing an over 300% jump compared to 2014. It was followed by Egypt with $6.9 billion in FDI, whilst Mozambique had $3.7 billion. Ghana was tied with Morocco, recording an FDI of $3.2 billion in 2015. For many, Ghana's performance is interesting, especially at a time that the FDI witnessed a significant decline in 2015 compared to what it recorded in 2014. But UNCTAD in the report attributes the decline in foreign direct investments across the region to the recent sharp decline in commodity prices. UNCTAD was, however, optimistic that things would pick up for Ghana and other countries in Africa this year. And domestic airline operators could soon enjoy some respite as their long-standing concerns of overtaxation are uh, addressed as government initiate plans in this regard. The operators were directed to start paying VAT on their operations, resulting in a sharp increase in the airfares. But Transport Minister Fifi Kweta says they are working to address the concerns. Really, uh, we, we have listened to very carefully and uh, I give them assurance that definitely it's an issue I'm taking up with uh, our friends in the finance ministry. Uh, and finance ministry clearly, at least um, preliminary uh, re response is positive. Uh, it's a question of um, ensuring that we can uh, get it I mean, accomplished as soon as possible so we can bring some relief to the domestic operators. Mm -hmm. Clearly they have a case. In that case, has to do with competitiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's an issue that I'm sure will get resolved. Uh, so I'm constantly trying to get finance to quickly get me a uh, clear timeline so that we'll be able to get some, some, some good announcement. And that will be it for business. But there's more business at 1, 1 1.30 on the marketplace. Coming up next is your sports. My name is John Kojamwako. <music> Good afternoon, my name is Baba Tanda. Welcome to the sports segment on News Today. Let's get talking right here, right now. And hat to folks began training under newly appointed coach Sergio Daniel Munir Traguil this morning. Now, their Portuguese coach, who previously worked for the youth teams of Sporting Lisbon and Benfica, was appointed by the management of the Accra Base Club to take charge of the under-20 side as Auroras and the under-17 side, the Royal Oaks. But after the sack of Japanese coach Kenichi Atsuhashi earlier this week, he's, yet, uh, he's actually yet to be unveiled, but has already begun training with the Hearts of Folk team. Now, there are lots of questions that need to be answered, and helping me do that is coach and scout Ebenezer Sefa, who joins me on phone. Hello, coach uh, Eben. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Barbara. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Now, tell me, first of all, what does Sergio need to know about Ghanaian soccer and, for that matter, the Ghana Premier League? Well, thank you very much. And I must say that he needs to know more. Mm. He needs to know a lot of things about Ghana football. Yes, as much as um, it is all over the place, Ghana has got talent. Ghana players are very skillful. Ghana players are very disciplined on the field. Mm -hmm. So for me, he needs to know more. And fortunately for him, he's got people like Yalpreko and Nasamu, who has been with the team um, through the preseason until the first round of the league. So he should be able to, or they should be able to tell him much about Ghana football and Accra as a folk. Okay. Now, what must he do to build on, uh, actually to build on and also improve on what uh, Yatsuhashi did with the team in the first round of the league? Well, first of all, we have to ask ourselves that um, does he believe in the philosophy of Kenichi Yasuhashi, the head coach of Akra mm -hmm. Um Well, he has, he's been able to build the condition of the players. But as to the Tiki Taka that he's talking about, do they have the kind of players that can play the Tiki Taka like as the Barcelona used to do? How many of the house players have got the flair, have got the skills to do that Tiki Taka stuff? Does he know the players individually? Has he watched matches of a class of folk? That is the question we've been asking ourselves. So for me, I think that it is too early. He trained today with the team. 
and possibly he will be training tomorrow and subsequently he will be training. His first game is going to be against Dreams FC mm -hmm. at the Accra Sports Stadium. So after that game, I think we should be able to know whether he will be able to come up with the Tiki Taka that he's talking about and also we'll be able to know the players shortly or maybe have a long term. Okay, you, you just mentioned that Hart Tifoka playing against James FC at the resumption of the second round of the league. Now tell me, he must win this game to win the confidence of the fans who are already enraged that Yatuhashi has been sacked. Now, what must he do? He's very new to the side, though, but what must he do to win? Well, I think that he has to rely on his able assistance, Yapreko and Asamu. Because mm -hmm. for me, they've been with the team through the preseason and the first round of the league. And remember, uh, they've not been able to lose the game away from home in the first one of the league. They are the only team that has not lost the game away from home, and that Kenichi, Aswashi, and the Apreko and Asamo. So for me, for him to be able to relax and work properly on come Sunday, he needs to consult the assistance of the club. And I believe that his training programs from today to maybe Saturday before the game should be able to have a tactic to tactic with the Apreko and then Asamo. And I think that with that, he should be able to do something on Sunday. All right. Now, uh, he's known for his scouting credentials and very used to African players. Do you think he can use this to his advantage? Of course, yes. He may be able to know the African players or African parties. But at the end of the day, they are going to play a strong force like Dream Cells, who has add up to their squad. You talk of Abiy Kuenosin, former international, formerly player of Marcia Santé Kotoko and New York DBS, and then Teofros Anoba, formerly of uh, Ashanti Gold and Mediema. So for me, I think that... Uh, Playing against a stronger side like um, Dreams FC come Sunday, it is a test time for uh, the coach whether he'll be able to play or he'll be able to handle the team very well. Remember, uh, Kennedy has actually lost about three games at home. And for me, I think that this is an opportunity for him to be able to let the supporters that are, are back in, the supporters that are, are worried, the supporters that are chanting that they need Kennedy back, should, should be able to win the supporters back to his side, uh, the performance that he put up come Sunday. Coach Ebenezer Sefa, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Now, uh, let's move away from Ghana and quickly go to France. And uh, Group E and F will take center stage at the Euros today as they wrap up their group phase and contests. Now, first will be Group E. At the start, the Lumiere, Hungary take on Portugal, while Iceland take on Austria at the start de France. Now both games will kick off simultaneously at 16 hours GMT. Now the evening matches will see Italy um, and Ireland facing off at the start Pierre Marois. The other fixtures will be between Sweden and Belgium at the Alliance Riviera. Kickoff for both, uh, both Group F matches will be 19 hours GMT. And you should stick and stay with your Super Hits Radio Joy 99.7 FM because we will bring you commentary in the evening kickoffs. But uh, for now, if you want more updates, especially on the Portuguese coach who has started training with Hat to Folk, you should check out the sports page of myjoyonline.com. You can also follow us on Twitter. We are there at joysportsgh. On Facebook, it is joysports. I am on Twitter at Baba Tando. That's it for sports for now. Good afternoon. Now, the flag bearer of the new patriotic party, Nana Adodankwa Akufuado, has appealed to the creative industry to harness their power to help develop the country. He made this appeal when he met some persons from the creative arts industry in his Nima residence. Things that we need to do to make the creative arts, the creative industry in Ghana viable. And at the end of the day, also rewarding. I'm a great believer that it's a good thing to make money. And I'm not, uh, I respect, I'm not a socialist. I don't think that. It's a good thing to make money. Everybody should try to make money. And, uh, and uh, it helps. We've got a lot going for ourselves in Ghana. Yes. We're going through difficult times. The economy is in a poor shape. Uh, we seem to have a government that has, is not really very clear about what is going to happen in the future of this country. But these are matters that, God willing, we will resolve. What matters more is that, especially people like you, because so much 
of what any society takes as its, its spirit, as its pulse, is defined by you. You do it in song, you do it in, not only in, in film, you do it in plays, you do it in paintings, you do it in artifacts, and you express what the impulses of the society at the very given moment is. So, since you have that power, we should harness that power to the idea of a Ghana that works, the idea of a Ghana that has self-confidence, that is prepared to make its own unique contribution to the growth of world civilization. That has to be our goal. That we will have a Ghana whose men and women, whose thinkers and doers and artists are going to make a contribution to the way humanity develops and survives. Some of you I know directly, some of you I know by reputation, but I know there are many, 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 many people gathered in this house tonight who are having a really important impact on the lives of our people. How then should we all work and look at things together? That's how we wrap up for entertainment here on Joy News today. My name is Becky. Enjoy the rest of our programs. And that's how I wrap up on news today this afternoon on your Joy News channel here on Multi TV. My name is Kwabna Chencha Hinebuati. Remember, there's more news when you visit www.myjoyonline.com. John Amakun is standing by with the marketplace. Many thanks for your company. <laughs>